Ronnie O'Neill In a Riverview neighborhood in Florida, Ronnie O'Neill lived with his girlfriend Kenata Barron, nine-year-old daughter Ronivia O'Neill, and an eight-years-old son also named Ronnie. Kenyatta Barron had returned to school and was enrolled at Hillsborough Community College. She still found time to play football with her son in the front yard. She also made him bean pie. Ronnie's sister, Ronivia, was severely handicapped. She used a wheelchair and could not speak, so Ronnie learned some sign language to communicate with her. Ronivia went to school and was even recognized because of her positive attitude. The family lived peacefully until one day, the whole world changed for little Ronnie. It began on March 18, 2018 with a frantic 911 call as Kenietta Barron called for help and begged for her life. People in the neighborhood heard a hustle in the house in the middle of the night. They listened to an argument between O'Neill and Barron, and after a few minutes, they saw Barron running out of her house and screaming for help. At the same time, O'Neill was seen running after her with a gun. It was such a gruesome scene that no one dared to interfere. O'Neill caught her, grabbed her by her clothes, and threw her on the ground while Baron kept screaming for help. He brought his gun out, struck her three times, and shot her. Confirming she was dead, he returned home and saw his autistic daughter Ronivia O'Neill walking by a hatchet. O'Neill was so raged that he didn't even think once that in front of him was his own daughter, who doesn't have an understanding of anything going on at home. But that innocent girl had tears in her eyes when her father walked toward her. He picked up the axe, and with tremendous anger, he stabbed her head. He then looked around for his son Ronnie. As soon he saw him in the room, he brought out his knife, brutally stabbed him several times, doused him in the house in gasoline, and lit them on fire. What was their crime to die such a painful death? Why did the whole family end up this way? One of their neighbors heard Baron screaming and got scared. He locked himself and his kids in the bathroom and called 911. Other neighbors saw Baron lying dead outside the house, while many saw O'Neill killing her. When the Hillsborough County deputies arrived at the house, they saw little Ronnie staggered out of the home, suffering from several stab wounds and severe burns. He was in excruciating pain and was taken to the hospital. Ronnie survived, but his mother and sister both died. The trauma of losing his family was so harrowing that he feared his father would come for him again. It took him a long time to recover. Ronnie told deputies from his hospital bed that his parents talked about God and religion before the incident occurred. Other witnesses who gave recorded statements told deputies that O'Neill strongly believed that women were of lower stature than men. Many neighbors witnessed that O'Neill once threatened Barron in the past and was also seen yelling from the roof well before the incident. It seemed like O'Neill was not in the right state of mind. He has been hallucinating and fears that someone will kill him. The night of the murders, deputies said O'Neill made a 911 call and ranted about demons, referring to Baron by her nickname, Keek. Dispatcher, 911, what's your emergency? O'Neill, hey, I just been attacked by some white demon. Inside was inside. Keek, Keek, her name is Keek and she tried to kill me. During the trial, doctors said that they felt O'Neill was incompetent to stand trial. He was also sent to the hospital for a mental examination. In the years since his arrest, O'Neill was defended by court-appointed attorneys. But on the eve of his trial, he decided to defend himself. He clutched legal documents as he strode up to a television screen that showed his son at a child victim resource center, sitting at a table with a golden retriever by his side. To start, he exchanged pleasantries with the boy before attempting to debunk his testimony. Ronnie, now 11 years old, was braver than one could imagine. He came forward to fight the trial for his late mother and sister. For about 20 minutes in a Tampa courtroom, a jury listened to him describe what he survived three years ago. Hearing his mother hit with a shotgun blast, seeing his sister stabbed in the head with an axe, Ronnie testified that all he could see were tears from his little sister's face. At that moment, that child knew she was being betrayed in the cruelest, most tragic and sorrowful way. In the end, feeling himself get soaked in gasoline and lit on fire, every person sitting in the court had tears in their eyes. It was unbelievable that the head of the family would butcher his children and wife in such a brute way. O'Neill started questioning his son. Are there any, any questions? How you doing, Ryan? 
good. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Wunnell then sought to expose inconsistencies between the child's testimony and what the boy previously told investigators, namely, that he saw O'Neill kill his mother. Did you see me shoot your mom? No. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? No. O'Neill's calm, almost lawyerly demeanor during questioning contrasted with his bizarre and impassioned opening statements two days earlier. In that oration, he accused law enforcement officials of tampering with evidence and argued that it was Barron who had attacked the children that night and that he acted in self-defense. It was an unusual moment in an extraordinary trial. Hillsborough Circuit Judge Michelle Sisko allowed O'Neill to represent himself in his murder trial this week, determining that he was mentally fit, educated enough, and understood the consequences of such a decision. Ronnie O'Neill, 32, will officially spend the rest of his life behind the bar for the double murder of his girlfriend and daughter. He has been sentenced to three life terms plus 90 years in Hillsborough Country Court Friday. Little Ronnie has a new home, five new siblings that have accepted him into their lives, and new, loving parents who have formally adopted him. When Ronnie was recovering in hospital, Detective Blair brought Ronnie things from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers through his connections with the team. A bond developed between them, and one day when Blair was leaving for home, Ronnie held his hand and asked him to watch a movie with him. Blair looked into those innocent eyes filled with fear and loneliness and made a decision. He called his wife and told her to visit the hospital to watch a movie with Ronnie. That day the couple decided to adopt Ronnie. Ronnie now lives a peaceful life, but the trauma and pain in his heart will remain forever. That's a wrap for today. Don't forget to smash the thumbs up, share, and subscribe to the channel to see our latest content.